aspiring model who is doing time for murder, but he claims it's a crime he didn't commit. See what our investigation uncovered. This is Chicago's very own WGN News at Night. Just ahead tonight, he was an aspiring model who went from posing to prison for a double murder he says he didn't do. It's a living nightmare being in here. When you know you don't belong here. Can one eyewitness clear his name? WGN News investigates reasonable doubt. Young model gracing the pages of the Tribune's style section. His future looked promising until the day he was arrested and accused of murder. Today, Lethereal Boyd is relegated to life as a model prisoner, having been convicted of a double murder in 1990. Muriel Clare is here tonight with an exclusive investigation of his case. Muriel. Steve and Allison, Lethereal Boyd has been every day of the last 12 years behind bars, proclaiming his innocence. He's written hundreds of letters trying to get somebody to help him prove he's not a killer. Our exhaustive review of police reports and court files raised reasonable doubt. And the more digging we did, the more questions we had about the evidence or the lack of evidence that landed Boyd behind bars. But during the course of our investigation, we tracked down an eyewitness who never testified in court, an eyewitness who says she told detectives 12 years ago they had the wrong man. It was February 24th, 1990, 2 in the morning, and the bars along North Clark Street were letting out. Hundreds crowded the sidewalks near Wrigley Field. Suddenly, gunshots. In an instant, 19-year-old Michael Fleming was dead. His cousin, 22-year-old Ricky Warner, paralyzed from the neck down. Three bystanders were hit. <coughs> Police arrived within two minutes and rounded up a dozen eyewitnesses. They were college students, sailors, and teenagers, including Jennifer Bonanno. Bonanno was one of several people who saw the shooter. Being 19, you're still pretty innocent, and aren't used to seeing that kind of violence. Um, so the first time somebody is evil, <laughs> you don't forget what they look like very easily. What do you remember about the shooter? I think he was, he was shorter. He was only 5'9", five 5'10", five maybe. Um, not a very big man uh, in any way, shape, or form. Very, very dark complected. Um, I believe he had a small mustache. But the man detectives arrested was six foot two, light skinned and clean shaven. Prosecutors described Lethereal Boyd as an Uzi wielding attacker who was out to settle a drug debt. After a bench trial, Judge Shelvin Singer found Boyd guilty of first degree murder, sentencing him to more than 80 years in prison. Have you ever killed anybody? No, no, no. And yet you sit in here accused of having killed someone. I know in my heart that it's only by the grace of God that I've made it thus far. Because it's, it's a living nightmare being in here. When you know you don't belong here. Before prison, Lethereal Boyd had a promising career as a fashion model. He was 24 years old when he was arrested. Today, he is 36. His daughters, Camille and Olivia, have grown up without him. For the last decade, Boyd has spent all but 12 hours a week locked in his cell here at Stateville Prison. And there was no physical evidence linking you to the crime. There was no gun with your hand with your handprints. There was nothing, right? No. Absolutely nothing. And you were many miles away from the scene? I believe 20, 22 miles to be exact. The night of the shooting, Boyd says he was in this Ford City apartment eating pizza and watching basketball with his sister and her boyfriend, a corrections officer at the Cook County Jail. The boyfriend signed this affidavit, swearing he used the bathroom in the middle of the night and saw Boyd asleep in the guest bedroom. When Boyd learned police wanted to question him about a murder, he came here to what is now Area 3 Police Headquarters at Belmont and Western, not with his attorney, 
but with his parents and siblings. I asked them to place me in the lineup so they'd see they had the wrong person. Why, and, why were you convinced that they would see that they had the wrong person by putting you in the lineup? Because when you know you haven't done anything and you know you, you, you weren't there, there's no way. How can anybody pick you out of a lineup as the offender, the, the shooter, the killer? Police put Boyd in this lineup. That's him on the left. Nine eyewitnesses looked him in the eye, and not one picked him out as the shooter. And it was pretty clear with the police officer. I cannot pick anyone in this lineup. Is this the man that you saw um, pull a gun out of his coat and shoot? No, ma'am. They knew I didn't commit this crime. I believe they knew. And I believe they just wanted to close the case just to get it over with. And Jennifer Bonanno agrees. She says police knew Boyd was not the killer. Why? Because Bonanno says she specifically told police they had the wrong man. And I remember that very vividly looking at him in the lineup that day going, uh-uh. And, and I told the police that. And I asked the police officer after it was all said and done. I asked him who they had thought had done it. Who were they looking for us to pick? And I remember the gentleman that he picked. He was standing on the end of the lineup, um, a lot taller than the guy that I saw with the gun, uh, very, very much so lighter complected, no offense or doubts about it. They just didn't even look alike at all. But what Bonanno says she told detectives, that Boyd looked nothing like the killer, never made it into these official police reports. And Bonanno was never called to testify. But why you? Why were you so convenient to them? My name came about from my past, uh, my past involvement with drugs, unfortunately. Boyd had a minor police record, but had never been to prison. He acknowledges with remorse he was once a small-time drug dealer. One of his customers was one of the victims, Ricky Warner. It was Warner's I, father I who pointed detectives to Lethereal Boyd. Oh, Herbert Warner kid. told my police family. Boyd threatened his family over Ricky's you drug debt. Me and my whole Why did you pick Mr. Boyd out? Because he had came to my house, threatening it, to take me and my wife and life, the kids life, Ricky life. He had threatened to do that. Even after hearing from That's the victim's father, it. court transcripts show that Judge Shelvin Singer was leaning toward an acquittal, telling prosecutors there is really very little to connect the defendant to the shooting with no eyewitnesses placing Boyd at the scene, no murder weapon, and no physical evidence linking him to the crime, how could Boyd be found guilty? When we come back, we'll tell you about the dramatic testimony that changed the course of Boyd's trial, changed Judge Singer's moved the proceedings to the bedside of victim Ricky Warner. The only evidence that has me sitting here is Ricky's identification of me as the shooter. In an emotionally charged setting, with a tube down his throat, Ricky Warner testified from his hospital bed that Boyd shot him. I was speechless. I was dumbfounded. I couldn't believe that he was saying, I shot him. I just couldn't believe it was happening. It seemed like at that moment, I realized what was going on. You know, that, that I could actually end up in prison. Ricky Warner was shot in the back of the neck and paralyzed. According to police records we examined, when detectives first interviewed him here at Northwestern Memorial Hospital, he told them he never saw the man who shot him. But then, three days later, his story changed and the news story contradicted what eyewitnesses told police. Ricky was the only person who said he saw me get out of a white car, walk up on him, shoot him, walk back to the white car, get in the white car and drive away. But that night, at least four eyewitnesses told police they saw the gunman drive up in a brown Riviera and run away through an alley. It may be too late to resolve the contradiction since Ricky Warner died in 1993. But according to this affidavit, his own brother says before he died, 
Ricky told him he didn't know who shot him. He said he never saw the shooter's face. Demon we interviewed dozens of people connected to the case from Florida to Hawaii. We tracked down seven of the original nine eyewitnesses who viewed the lineup, and we showed each one a series of mugshots. Still, not one of them identified Lethereal Boyd as the killer. So if Lethereal Boyd didn't do it, who shot Michael Fleming and Ricky Warner? Interviews with several people led us to this man, Yuri Smith, known on the street as Cheesy, a violent gun-toting member of a Jamaican street gang. We asked Jennifer Bonanno to look at a photograph of Cheesy. Does that ring a bell? Yep. He was wearing like a, a black leather jacket though the night that I saw him and his hair was different. It was shorter. Again, that big square protruding jaw and his face was very clenched, um, you know, when he was doing what he was doing. Jennifer Bonanno believes Cheesy is the man she saw shooting at Fleming and Warner. I saw the man pull the gun out of his jacket. But detectives never questioned Cheesy about the murders and they never will. Yuri Cheesy Smith was shot and killed on a Chicago street corner eight years ago. For Lethereal Boy, Cheesy's demise makes it even more difficult to prove his innocence. What if I'm forced to continue to sit here for something I didn't do? I have two daughters who have grown up, been forced to, to grow up without me. You know, just so many things that most people take for granted. You know, I dream about. While Boyd dreams of freedom, Jennifer Bonanno has nightmares about what she calls a miscarriage of justice. He is innocent, and I know it because I was there. That's just sick and wrong. I'm sorry, it is. Well, Lethereal Boyd could spend the rest of his life in prison. He's not eligible for parole for another 30 years. Neither prosecutors nor police detectives would comment on camera for this story, but they say they stand behind Boyd's conviction. Tonight, the judge who put Lethereal Boyd behind bars says the new evidence we uncovered has convinced him Boyd deserves a new hearing. When I look at the evidence, I'm only looking at the evidence that's before me. I cannot go out and conduct my own investigation. Judge Singer still has the notes he took during Lethereal Boyd's trial 12 years ago. He acknowledges we've turned up critical evidence which never came out in court. He can't explain what's not there. Uh, he can't evaluate what's not there. What if I'm forced to continue to sit here for something I didn't do? What Bonanno says she told detectives that Boyd looked nothing like the killer never made it into these official police reports. There's no question in my mind that the information should have been made available. It should have been provided to the defense. Uh, that was the law in 1990 at the time of trial. It's the law today. Boyd's attorneys are preparing an appeal based on Bonanno's story, and Judge Singer says her testimony should be heard. You've got to evaluate her testimony, in my opinion, when she testifies under oath in court and is subject to cross-examination. If, if I were a judge now and I had that case, I certainly would want to hear that testimony. Now, whether or not that's enough to uh, get the new trial, I'm not going to say at this point. And by golly, I thought there was enough to convict. I'm not saying he didn't, he, he should be acquitted at this point. But You're saying it should be revisited? It should be looked at. It certainly should be. Well, a Chicago police spokesman had no comment on the allegation that homicide detectives withheld evidence from the defense in this case. Now, you can watch our original investigation and hear more from Lethereal Boyd by logging on to WGNTV.com and clicking on the feed room. Steve and Allison, police and prosecutors both tell us that they stand behind the conviction. And of course, that appeal is expected to be filed within uh, the next two weeks. Well, it's very compelling to hear from the judge, and we know you'll follow up, too. Absolutely. Thank you.